Yeah, man, ask all you want about VG bits. I don't mind. Not gonna hurt my feelings. Sideboard Scout Flatbed. Sideboard. Sideboard. Oh, you don't want to spoil. Well, I guess it depends on Baka. The thing I lost wasn't important. Uh I wouldn't say important in that my in that aspect of what you mean. I mean it was useful and I didn't want to lose it. But, you know, it is what it is. It wasn't like mission critical or anything though. Just handy is all. Was it worth the item I gained? <sighs> yes and no. The reason I say that is I knew this item wasn't going to stay with me forever anyway. Now is not the time I wanted to lose it, but I don't think there would have been a time I wanted to lose it. <laughs> but eventually they were going to want it back, so... And I get why he wanted it back. He wanted to take... He wanted to take a, a, a very powerful tool away from me. Are you asking in the realm of D&D, &D, or are you asking in the realm of our campaign? In D&D, &D, you know, I'm a, it's, yeah, it's a race in, in all D&D, &D, yeah. Silent Observer. <laughs> oh, they want me to go out there. Okay. Well, that's fine. We're going to do a bunch of running around in this vehicle anyway. Yeah, dude, Critical Role is awesome. What is Critical Role? Critical Role is, uh, 
a professional D and D playing with voice actors and stuff like that. They are really good. They have an animated series that they've uh, they're creating coming to Amazon in like a week. Am I going to watch The Legends of Vox Machina? Hell yeah, dude. Keep in mind, if you watch it, the animated series is going to be a little different from the, um... from the D&D campaign. It's going to be mostly the same. But like, like all animated series based off of a, a book or a, something else similar to that, there's going to be differences. So... <laughs> Even going back and rewatching the actual gameplay is is going to get you a lot of more information. How can you be a professional? What's a game of chance? I don't mean professional as in they're uh, they're really good at it. I mean they're really good at it, sure. But uh, I mean professional in the fact of this is their primary job. They play D and D for a living. Uh, but yeah, they are professional voice actors and real actors so when they get into character they're really fucking good like half the cast is in Warcraft World of Warcraft or regular Warcraft um The only one I can think of that may not actually be in World of Warcraft is Sam. I think everyone else is in it. Maybe Ashley isn't in it, but... Alright, Forged by the Sea I apparently already have. Yeah. Sam is in Bugsnax, though. That's true. I think Legends of Vox Machina got renewed for a season two already. I think that was part of the deal with Amazon, is they wanted two seasons instead of just one. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if they got more. I know what see. I know the storyline for season two. Storyline for season two is going to be easy. You know what the, the storyline in Season 1 is Briarwoods. Uh, that's easy. They've announced that one. The storyline for Season 2? Easy solution. Chroma Conclave. Uh, and then the storyline for Season 3 should be... An orgy. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? An orgy. An orgy. Uh, I think... I think season three should... I think season three and four, they should do two more seasons. And three and four should be the final story. 
it, yeah, season three will probably be like introduction to the main villain, uh, realizing. Well, no, v vestiges were season two, were story were Chroma Conclave. They may change it. They may make it. Uh, they may make the vestiges part of the final arc instead of part of the Chroma arc. Just because they could do a season three and a season four, where season three is introduction and then the vested searching, and season four is, you know, build up and final battle. That would make the most sense. You just it doesn't really matter when the vested searching comes in, just that it happens. Season three is all about Terry. <laughs> Do I think I'll do it with campaign one and two, or two and three later? Depends on the success. This is Cletus. Doesn't Cletus. Oil barrels. Okay. Thirty minutes each? Yeah, I think that's right. It may be twenty two minutes. I don't know if they I don't know if they're gonna try to do it for standard TV schedule or if they're gonna say no, it's thirty minutes. I also wouldn't be surprised if the final episodes were like an hour. No suitable trailer to attach? Isn't this the scout trailer? Oh no, scout trailer's over here. Yeah, the final episode might be an hour. Really depends on how they want to do it. Yeah, yeah. The battles will go much faster in the show than they do in the actual D&D uh, uh, episodes. Like, keeping in mind the final battle in Campaign 1 against the final big boss is a little over five hours, and they could probably do the whole final battle in 30 minutes. In a 30 minute episode, easy. Yeah, episode 114 is a little over five hours. <laughs> you check the playlist. Well, the final fight in campaign two was five hours, but that was the final episode. Or that was the second to the last episode, which was five and a half, which was five and a half hours. But that wasn't the entire fight. The entire fight for campaign one is the entire episode. Like, episode 113 ends with, uh, essentially, roll for initiative. And then the end of episode 114 is, you know, the end of the fight. So it's five and a half hours of solid fighting. It is... brutal. <laughs> I think that's why a lot of people were a little disappointed with the end of Campaign 2, is the final fight wasn't nearly as brutal, but it was probably, uh, uh, it was probably, uh, probably because they were much better at the game by then. If it was something you wanted to watch, where should you start? Uh, Google, or, or go to YouTube and type in Critical Role Campaign 2, Episode 1. Start with Campaign 2. Campaign 2 is much more uh, beginner-friendly. 
easier to get into, easier to figure out what's going on, uh, easier to get into the characters, get into the players, all that stuff. The story's much easier to follow. Uh, the problem with Campaign 1 is Campaign 1 technically starts like 40 hours into this, into the campaign because they played at home for a lot uh, before they started streaming it. So you jump into like the middle of a storyline. Yeah, well you have to you have to keep in mind campaign one and campaign two, while it's the same game, it's completely different characters. Everything is different. The story is different, the characters are different, the NPCs are different. They're they're the only reason they're related in any way is it's the same people playing the same kind of game in the same world. It's just like twenty years later. So there are a couple of callbacks to campaign one, but nothing important. Um, nothing you really need to know t in order to follow the story. Uh, if you find yourself at Campaign 1... Yeah, they're all like level 8 or 9 when they started uh, streaming Campaign 1, yeah. So they were already like... I wouldn't say halfway through the campaign, but they were probably like a quarter of the way through the campaign. Because once they started streaming it, the leveling process really slowed down. Will they explain anything? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. They explain lots of stuff. Like, they may not explain exactly everything that's going on, like all the dice throws and stuff like that, but you, you can quickly pick up on what's going on. All the story is explained in great detail. All the characters are explained in great detail. Um, the classes are explained because all the peop all the players are playing new characters uh, that they've never played before. So even the even the players are having to learn it as stuff goes along. So they make mistakes, and the and the dungeon master explains what's going on and how to play their character properly. Um, so yeah, it's it's very good for for new people to get into. Uh, campaign 1 doesn't start like that. <laughs> so, if you're new to D&D and you want to watch Critical Role, I always tell people start with Campaign 2. If you find that you really love it and you really enjoy it and you finish Campaign 2 and you're like, I'd, I'd love to watch more, then I would say, okay, now go watch Campaign 1. Just keep in mind that the first, like, 30 episodes are going to be rough. Because... Um... They're, 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 that's the that's the first 30 episodes of them ever doing it so they're not very they're, they're very nervous around the cameras um, their audio equipment is not perfectly set up uh, stuff like that why is it why is it so important to say that you got a natural 20? A natural 20 in most situations is considered critical, which means uh, it's probably an automatic success. Baka is incorrect. Uh, saying that it always succeeds is misleading. That is incorrect. Just because you roll a natural 20 doesn't mean that you're going to win. Um, same thing with a natural one. It's the exact opposite. Um, a natural 20 on an ability check also is not a guaranteed success. That is also incorrect. Exactly, exactly. Uh, a natural 20, if you're attacking an enemy, a natural 20 means that you hit, regardless, and that you do double damage. Uh, DC is your defense 
is a, a character's defense. Uh, and it's a it's a numerical value. And it is it helps determine whether or not you you injure the enemy. So Oh wait, that's DC. You're right. That's difficulty challenge. You're thinking AC. DC and AC are two different things, and they're commonly confused for each other, so make sure not to get those confused. Oh, this is a race. I don't want to do that. AC is armor class. Yeah. DC... That's a confusing statement, Baka. DC is not something is not a number you need to overcome. DC is an indicator of how difficult an enemy or an encounter is. In saving throws. Okay. Well, you you need to be specific. <laughs> That's a problem. You gotta be specific in these things, because these things matter. So for example, let's let's use a since you guys are both interested and new. Let's use a a generic uh, a battle, right? Just two characters fighting each other. Uh let's say I'm fighting Baka and I try to hit Baka. Uh, let's say Baka has an armor class of 16, you know, which is decent. It's pretty good. Um, if I roll a 14, and people think the game's not complicated, it isn't. It's just intimidating. That's what it is. The game's not complicated. It's just intimidating. Those are two different things. Also, what's up, Destroyer? I'm dumb, and I learned it pretty fast. And I'm not confident. Yeah. Cappy learned it real quick. It it's It's scary at first, but that's all. Yeah, the thing is, there's a lot of basic rules that are all really easy to understand. The, the advanced part comes when applying multiple basic rules all at the same time. That's when things start to get confusing and complicated. Um, well, not complicated, but confusing. So anyway, regardless. Let's get back to our example here. Let's say Baka has an armor class of 16, and I roll a 14 to hit her. It's like, I need to roll to hit Baka, and I roll a 14. Uh, normally, I, I didn't beat 16, so that means I didn't hit her. But I may have a weapon that gives me plus 3 to my attack. So I roll a 14, plus 3, it's a 17. That's higher than 16, so I hit Baka. Now that's just, that's just finding out if I can physically hit her. That doesn't determine damage. Or anything like that. It's just, did you hit her? Yes or no? Then you did. Then you determine. Uh, then you determine damage. All right. Let's hold on a second. Let me latch onto this. So the, the thing that intimidates a lot of people is there's a lot of there's a lot of numbers involved and a lot of people don't like math. So they get very like, "Oh, I don't like this." So, I have a particular weapon that does Let's say let's keep it easy at first. Let's say 1d6 damage, right? So the, the indicator 1d6, what that means is I have a one dice that has six numbers on it. So one standard six-sided dice. So I throw 1d6, whatever number that comes up, that's the amount of damage I dealt. Pretty simple. And she takes that off of her health, and when she reaches zero, she's unconscious. Let me 
get up a little higher here. What kills a player? Uh, so, if your health point, it, there's two different ways to die. First off, if your health reaches zero, you become unconscious. Then while you're unconscious, you have to make every turn, you have to make a saving throw to see if you bleed, if you continue to bleed out. So, if, let's say, let's say I reduce Baka to zero hit points, right? Uh, if I reduce her to zero hit points every turn, she has to roll a d20. If it's lower than a 10, then she fails one death save. You have to fail three to die. To actually die. Uh, they don't have to be three in a row, they just have to be three before you fail three. So... You need to succeed in three, uh, and, or, and or so the most you're going to do is you're going to roll five, for five turns in a row, and at the end of five turns you will have either succeeded in three or failed in three, um, and that determines whether you live or die. If you succeed in if you if you fail in three, you just die. You bleed out and die, uh, and there are ways to try to revive you afterwards, but usually that's complicated. Um, if you succeed in three, you wake up with one hit point. No, Baka. Too complicated. The end. <laughs> Get into that stuff later. Okay, yeah, stabilize. Yeah, okay. That's true. I was wrong in that part. Step one when teaching somebody a brand new game, don't throw all the rules at them all at once. And if you have no heal or potions... It, okay, so let's say you succeed at three... Uh, you are just permanently at zero hit points until someone can heal you. That's all that. I can't get a good camera angle here. Can I zoom in? Ugh. V. I would like to clip into the rocks, please. I guess I could zoom out more. See, Baka, this is why you're throwing too much information at them. There's not a time limit. There is not a time limit. The time limit, you have to, here's the thing, you have to succeed at a certain number of throws, right? You have to succeed three times to keep yourself from bleeding out and dying. If those, those throws are done in each round, so a round is six seconds, doesn't really matter, that's not important. Um, a round is six seconds, if you're in a battle, if not, if you're not in a battle, let's say you just like, you're climbing a cliff and you fall off and you take a crap load of damage and die, you would just do you would just do three rolls like boom boom boom. Doesn't matter. That's that's not the important thing. 
time is not important uh, in this step. Uh, but what Baka was saying earlier was that you can have criti critical successes and critical failures when you're rolling for your death saves. So, uh, you have the natural 1 and a natural 20. If you're rolling for death saves, a natural 1 means you fail two of them, not just one. And a natural 20 means you come back to life with one hit point. It's just a way to, like, reward and punish people for getting exceptionally good rolls or exceptionally bad rolls. That's all it is. The longest I've gone without dying, an entire campaign. Dying is not that common. People make it out to be like you're going to be dying all the time. Dying is relatively uncommon, generally speaking. If you're playing smart and you have a good group and your DM is not an asshole, dying is pretty uncommon. Yeah, if you're gonna die, you're gonna die really early in the game. Generally speaking. Because that's when you have the least amount of hit points. That's when nobody can heal you. Uh, that's when you're not very good at figuring out how to play your character properly. Once you get to mid-game, dying is pretty freaking rare. Because everybody's good at their job, you know how to play your character, a bunch of people can heal you, you've probably got healing potions. Dying is the least is one of the least concerning things in D&D. Because any good uh, game master or dungeon master, any good dungeon master doesn't want to kill the players. It happens. You may roll really really bad and the enemy may roll really really good a bunch of times in a row and you may just die. You know, shit happens, but but yeah, no dungeon master is actively trying to kill their players. No good dungeon master. I forgot I had a differential lock on this truck. What kind if what kind of time on average will a DM put into a game? Uh that varies wildly. Some plan, some make stuff up on the fly. Others will spend hours and hours and hours and hours. They'll spend like three, four, five times as much time planning than the actual game will ever take.
that's not a really good indicator of of anything how long the DM's plan that doesn't necessarily indicate a good or bad dungeon master I've had bad dungeon masters that planned for hours and hours and hours and hours and good ones that planned for super long times and vice versa But yeah, the the main thing about playing in Dungeons and Dragons that should concern you is not how do I die and how do I not die. Like if that's your first question, uh, isn't that what campaign books are for? Yeah, yeah, you can get a campaign book. Play play a pre-created campaign. That does save a lot of time. Some people want to make their own custom stories, though. And those do take a lot more time. That's kind of what I was getting at, is like, you can pick up your own, you can pick up a campaign book that has a story already written for you, and just kind of do what the campaign book says, and you can have an amazing story. And an amazing time. Or you can have a custom campaign setting where the dungeon master will put in hundreds of hours of research, and planning, and the whole thing sucks. <laughs> you know. So planning, planning time is not indicative of how good a game's gonna be. What about loot? That's up to the dungeon master. He will give you stuff or he won't. Generally speaking, you get loot or money. And if you get money, you go to town and you buy cool shit. There are shopping episodes. <laughs> Essentially, you know. You can have like a three hour session where everyone just shops. It happens. Random loot is kind of a double-edged sword, though. Random loot is not necessarily a good way to do it in a long-running campaign where loot is important. Because one character can get nothing but garbage every single time. It's kind of like playing Darkest Dungeon. I mean, Darkest Dungeon is built on... Is the, the basics are built on D&D &D rules, yeah. Did you ever play Dragon Age? No? Did you ever play World of Warcraft? You ever play Neverwinter Nights? Do you ever play Diablo? Do you ever play Torchlight? Do you ever play any games like any of those at all? Generally, those are all built on a basis of D&D rules. It's just the game is doing all the rolling for you. Do me a favor, guys. Ignore everything Baka says. Yeah, Skyrim is based off of D&D. If you ever played Skyrim, that's all D&D &D rules.
Baka keeps bringing in advanced stuff and complicated rules and more information that is not important at all to learning D&D. It is not important. There's no quicker way to get some to lose someone's interest in something you love than to drown them in unimportant information at the front. Get them addicted, Baka, then give them the hard stuff. Because then they're invested and they want to know about the new cool hard stuff. Because the, the really fun easy stuff, they got that down. Not saying that any of that stuff is hard. It's not. It's all easy. It's just, it's more to learn. And it's not stuff that a beginner will ever deal with. If you ever get into it, if you ever like, hey, I watched, I watched Campaign 2 A Critical Role, I really want to try playing D&D. Uh, the first thing to do is to find a D&D group that is beginner friendly because they don't deal with any of the complicated shit. They're just like, we're gonna play with the basics and make sure you're comfortable with that. I don't think Baka will ever be part of that. It's meant to be gonna be, it's meant to be a beginner module You don't really understand how to start out your character correctly? There's no wrong way to build a character. People, people will tell you that you're doing your character wrong. And that is incorrect. These are the same people that will watch somebody play Mass Effect and tell them that they're making the wrong decisions. There's no wrong decision. There's no wrong way to build your character. A mage with all strength. Those exist. There have been people that have played pure strength mages and have gone the entire, gone to like max level and have wrecked shit with that. It can be done. It may not be the most optimal way, but it can be done. That's the thing. You can play a wizard that's pure strength. You just need to know how to play a wizard that's strength-based. And that's not necessarily intuitive. <laughs> that's more of an advanced player kind of thing to do. When you're creating a character, it'll initially tell you uh, what those characters' primarily important stats are. What about no weapon? Sure, play a monk. They fight with their fists. Problem solved. Yeah, you could do a barbarian too. Monk would be better, but you can do a, a, a zero weapon barbarian, sure. Yeah, you don't generally want to spread out your stat points. You want to put, generally speaking, you want to put your stat points in the statistics that benefit your character the most. You do want to have a little bit of spread. Uh, but, I mean, it's not required, not that important. Like, to use your example, uh, a, it, they're not mages, they're wizards, but a wizard uh, would be intelligence-based. So you would want to put most of your stats into intelligence. You also want stats elsewhere, 
you want dexterity and you want constitution and stuff like that, but you know, the bulk of your stuff should go to intelligence. RPG lit? Yeah, that's exactly what those are. They're D&D, &D, but they're like real people in a fake environment kind of thing. Exactly. You know, I just realized I'm taking this um, this truck to sell and I don't need the cargo. Ugh. Refuel. In your book, Dungeon Level 4, you can change your race and choose a subclass. I mean... You don't really change your race in D&D, but I mean, yeah, sure. Essentially the same thing. You can have some people... You can choose a subclass, or you can choose not to have one. Subclassing is like, um... Choosing a subclass is like having a specialization in medicine. Uh, it's not required, uh, but it does kind of, it focuses you in a particular way. It gives you benefits to certain things and prevents you from getting others. So, you know. Uh, you could be a... Uh, you could be a fighter that that uh, decides he wants to be uh, a nimble, agile fighter, as opposed to a stand in there and swing a big weapon. And so you'll get you'll get more more features, more abilities that focus towards nimble and agile fighting, and less that focus on muscle punching and like huge weapons and stuff. So you have to make sure if you're going to subclass that you want to do the particular thing that you're going for. Because usually when you subclass, a dungeon master won't let you change. They're like, you choose this, you're that for the rest of the game. So make sure it's what you want. Like in, in our D&D campaign, um... I play a cleric, right? And clerics have multiple subclasses. You can focus on being a a battle cleric, where you get in there and stand face to face with the enemies and go blow for blow, and you focus on dealing damage and taking damage. Or you can be a healing cleric, where you prefer to stay out of the the bulk of the fighting, and your main your main job is healing and buffing. Uh, your friends. Yeah, I also get to choose my subclass immediately. Yeah. In D in D and D, subclasses have different names depending on what class you have. Uh, but the generic overarching term is a subclass. So, for example, a cleric, I have domains that I can go into. My subclasses are called domains. Uh, a warlock's subclass is his patron. You choose a type of patron, and that changes how things happen. And it's it, they're all subclasses, they just have fancy names so that it it jives flavor-wise with your uh, your class. But essentially they're all sub they're all subclasses. 
And it's really, it, all a subclass is, like I said, is a way to focus on a particular aspect of your class. So like clerics are good at a lot of things, so they have a lot of subclasses. Um, so that you can, you can focus more on one particular thing, or you can not focus at all and you can just be mediocre at everything. All right, what am I doing here? So I have, I have essentially opened all the missions. Let us, oh, Silent Observer, let's do that. That's an easy one to get. So I'm gonna come down here, go here, here. I'll just go around, it's fine. Bless you, Cappy. Yeah, you keep in mind that the lit RPG books that you're reading are usually more humor based than like there are basis in in D, D rules, but like obviously there's no subclass called child actor. Uh oh sorry. <laughs> What's up, Lucid? Sorry, man. Got sidetracked. You want a highlight reel of just Cappy sneezing in the background? <laughs> Could you imagine? I love you, Lucid! They're acknowledged. Dude, I pulled a trailer, I pulled a scout trailer with steel on it halfway across this map before I realized I have an, I have a differential lock and I don't need the steel so I could delete it from my trailer. So I struggled halfway across the map. Thanks for including you in the stream highlights. Dude, you're included in a bunch of them. I've already made four of them, I think. And I think, I want to say you're in every one so far. You may not be in, you may be in only three out of the four, but you're in, you are frequently in the highlights. Well, I haven't posted all the videos. I'm going to do them once a week. I've just, I've already created four episodes and scheduled them for release, but I'm, I'm, I'm scheduling them all like on Sunday. So every Sunday there should be one. For the next like two months probably. Hey Valkyrie, what's up? How are you? We're doing all right. We've been talking about a lot of D and D stuff because we brought up uh, we brought up Critical Role, and now Two Talon and Courtney are interested. Yeah, I learned that a while back. I just keep forgetting. I got into the habit of holding initially, and then I learned like eight or ten hours ago that I could go F F F F F, um, and it's just like you build up that muscle memory and you forget.
But yeah, regardless, if you guys are interested in in D&D &D and you want to watch Critical Role, Campaign 2 Episode 1 is the best place to start. And then if you get all the way through Campaign 2 and you're like, oh my god, I want more, then go back to Campaign 1. You only just started Campaign 3? I just got caught up on it uh, this morning, or this afternoon. You've been against watching it for years? How so? Is it just like, I don't want to... I don't want to join the crowd kind of thing? Or was it all like, ew, nerd stuff, gross? The overhype? I can get that. What's funny, though, is when you get, like, really deep into it... How many campaigns are there? There are two complete campaigns, and they've just recently started their third. Their third campaign is only, like, on episode 8 or 9. And if you keep in mind, campaign 1 was 115 episodes, and campaign 2 was, like, 137 or 140, somewhere around there. They're long. So the fact that they're only, they're they're just barely at like episode 8 or 9 is like th this is the very beginning. Campaign 2 is the is the is currently the only one that goes from essentially beginning to end all on stream. Uh, campaign 1 kind of jumps in about 20 or 30% of the way through at the beginning. Why isn't D&D &D a movie? Uh, there have been D&D &D movies. They've all been terrible. Uh, primarily because they... The magic of D&D &D can't be distilled into two hours. I, I, that's pretty much everyone who loves D&D &D is like, you can't really make a D&D &D movie. You can have a fantasy movie that's based in D&D. I think Critical Role is going to be the first true, like, actual D&D, like, thing that is, is probably going to be successful as a show or movie. Most like I I don't th I can't think of a single movie that was advertised as a D and D movie that was actually successful. I think they all have bombed. And it's been for two main reasons. It's for a long time it was too niche for the masses, and for the people who were into D and D, uh, it it doesn't catch the magic. The cartoon was okay? I never actually watched the cartoon. You're talking about the one from the 90s, right? Well, I ran out of air in the middle of that sentence. <laughs> Did you hate when that happened? If the Critical Role show ex is really good, the genre will explode. I don't necessarily think the genre will explode, but it'll definitely get a lot more popular. I don't really see the genre exploding, per se, but... Definitely getting a lot more attention, yeah. Uh, where's my truck? Did I take my truck back to the dam? Probably did. Yeah.
Uh, I think it would be put into the genre D&D, but yeah, the genre D&D. But it's Jason and the Argonauts came out before D&D was invented. Like D&D was invented in the 70s, I think. Or at least the D&D we, we know today was invented like in the 70s or early 80s. Alright, so what I need to do... I guess we can go get these oil barrels? How big are these? Are these like little tankers? No, they're containers. Oh, look at that one! Ew, how the fuck do you do that? I'm guessing you have to come this way. Gross. Oh, fuck. That mission, bro. All right, Cletus is going to have to wait. Tourist attraction. Explore Hollis Island. Man, I've been there. Crane it up from the cliff? Oh, my God. That's some bullshit right there. All right, let's go explore Hollis Island, I guess. We'll switch back over to the truck and go over there. All right, so we're going to go down the mountain. We'll be coming down the mountain when she comes. Gross. Uh, Hollis Island is over there. It's easy enough. Okay. We'll come across here. Come get fuel and then head over to the island. Easy. Back to, back to character creation too, Talon. If you're interested enough in D&D &D that you think you might want to try playing, the best thing to do is find somebody who will put on a one-shot. Uh, a one-shot is a D&D uh, a, a &D campaign that is usually only one episode. Um, you, you could usually complete the whole thing in like two to four hours generally speaking um, and half the time they have pre-created characters or they may tell you create a character that's this level so you just build a character from scratch and then go level up once okay let me choose all the new stuff I get level up again until you get to whatever level they say they want you at um, but if you if you find somebody that's like I'll do a one-shot and uh, it's it's newbie friendly. Then you can just sit down. You can you can start a Discord call with the DM and sit down with them, and they'll walk you through the whole process real slowly. Be like, okay, what do you want to do? What what kind of a person do you want to be? This is the kind of classes you should choose from. Here's the differences. All right, you chose that one. Let's choose the race now. Races don't matter other than flavor. Cherry. Cherry. Cappy wants a cherry race. I guess, to be flank, a red tea. A what? Red tiefling. Tiefling. Yeah, that would work. 
A good, but a good dungeon master will walk you through the entire process from start to finish and explain everything as they go and be like, this is this, this is that, this is how this works. And I am stuck. Oh, I don't have all wheel drive on, that's why. LOL. And what's funny is after you make a after you make your first character, thank you. Uh, you can go and make any number of additional characters using the same basic information. Um, make a bunch of the easiest way to learn how characters work is to build them from scratch and just kind of like look at what they can do. Why, why did I build this one? Why did I build this sorcerer and the sorcerer can't cast any magic? Like, what did I do that was wrong there? And then just kind of screw around with it. Not all dungeon masters are teenage nerds. I mean, all dungeon masters were at one point a teenage nerd, yes. At least to some extent. But that doesn't mean all dungeon masters are bad either. How do you become one? <laughs> you just do. Surprisingly enough, that isn't that is a valid statement to that question. You just do. You just become a dungeon master. Play some D&D, find out if you like it. If you really like it, and you really like to make stories, you don't even need years of playing, no. Some people's first foray into D&D is as a dungeon master. You do need to know a lot of the rules and how things work, so usually the people that do dungeon mastering first, they probably own a lot of the D&D books, and have read them a lot, probably watched a lot of D&D. &D. They may not have played themselves, but they may have uh, watched friends play. It's not required. A dungeon master is not a rank. <laughs> you are just the person who is running the game. You create the story, you make the narrative, you try to author versus reader, essentially, you try to drive the players in the direction that where you want them to go. I repeat, try, because uh, you're probably not going to work all the time. <clears throat> you, you play all of the non-player characters, all the NPCs, that's you. Or lead them through a pre-created game. Yeah, exactly. If you wanted to be a DM, that'd be the best way to start. Is to, to do a, a pre-created campaign and play through it. Because you just read what's in the book. Almost everything you could need is in that book. Enemies, loots, locations, NPCs, uh, side quests that are related to the main story. Uh, other things that have no effect on the game whatsoever. Just flavor. Uh, descriptions are all in there. How you would explain stuff to your characters. Well, yeah, 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 exactly. A good DM wants you as the player to win. They don't want to kick your ass. You, 
yeah, one of... Uh, I've watched some interviews with Matt Mercer, and he said some of the most favorite times as a DM he's had is when the players have flat out just completely outsmarted him. To where he's been like, I, I don't... Yeah. Yeah, all right, that works. All, all this planning I made and all these problems I was going to to hit you with, uh, you guys bypassed it in like 30 seconds with an extremely smart move that I did not anticipate. So, shit. Uh, 